I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. We're really glad that you're here. It's an exciting week. Uh, mostly it's exciting because last week so many games came uh, to us from the Essen Fair, and so I have lots and lots of great games to talk about, to the point where there's no way we're going to get them all reviewed fast enough to please y'all, but we're going to try to get as many of them reviewed as we can. Uh, so if you haven't noticed, Mike Delisio, who's been a contributor on the Dice Tower in the past, is now here full time working with us as a video editor, and you'll see him on camera a little bit more as time goes by and doing various things. And so he'll be doing a live Q&A today, so I hope you come back and check that out. Also, one week from today, our 24-hour marathon starts. Actually, I think I have it's like 30 hours at this point, but it's going to start at 10 a.m. on Monday of next week. And one of the reasons you want to watch it is because it is going to be uh, big and grandiose and a uh, lot Lots of people are coming in. Joe Stedman's going to be here, and and Dan, our war game Dan, and the brothers Murph, and so that's going to be fun. Uh, but also, we're going to be handing out prizes. It's being sponsored by Awaken Realms, and so we're going to give out I don't know like twelve different games over the course of the event. So I hope that you you can only win those if you come and watch us live. So hopefully you guys enjoy that. We're looking forward to doing it. And so then there's Thanksgiving and all sorts of things coming up in the future. Right now, though, I want to get started here with today's episode, and let's do it. I'm going to be changing the things I found on the internet to thing I found on the internet, essentially. Uh, It's the same kind of segment, folks, but I want to talk about one thing a little bit more in depth each week. And the thing I'm about to talk about, unfortunately, I have to change a little bit. I was going to talk about uh, Chad Jensen, who is in hospice, but at just right before I recorded this, I found out that Chad Jensen passed away. And I wanted to say a few things uh, about him. Chad Jensen is known for um, making one of the most well-known war games that exists, Combat Commander, and its various different f- uh, forms that are out there of this game. Also, many people know him for Dominant Species, uh, Welcome to Centerville, uh, Urban Sprawl. He's done many games. Uh, but Combat Commander is probably, I guess, like his legacy. Uh, Chad Jensen, I, I interviewed him well over a decade ago about this because it, we, he originally owned a board game store, transitioned out of that into designing games, and unfortunately just lost a battle with cancer. But it was a very, very nice person, and my interactions with him, which I believe I may have met him one or two times in person, but mostly were all online, were really well done. I am not a war gamer, uh, playing heavy war games. I don't know that I ever will be one, but I definitely played Combat Commander Europe, played Combat Commander Pacific, actually, and it's not the kind of game that I normally would play, but I figured I'd give it a chance, and I found that there was so much thought, so much... uh, You know, theme, it it just felt like it was a labor of love. And we tend to throw around that term a lot, you know, labor of love, but it really felt this way. And Dominant Species, even though it's a game I don't play as much these days, definitely was a game that was like, hey, folks, this is a heavy Euro game, worker placement game designed by a war gamer. Have at it. And people went bananas. It really was highly regarded. And it's a very, very good game. And one that people should check out. And he was very involved online in the different communities. And so... Yeah, well, just give him honor and credit, and we, you know, offer our sympathy to his wife and his family, and uh, you know, the community's a little less today because he's gone. But uh, check out his games, even if you're not a war gamer like me. Combat Commander is something that you might find interesting. So, yeah, a bit of sad news this week, but we're really glad for Chad's contributions to our community and the hobby as a whole. Ben. your turn. Ooh. Hi guys, I am Randy. I'm Alan. We're We Game Together. Talking about this game. Rurik, Dawn of Kiev. <sighs> which Dawn of I Kiev. understand this correctly as saying I it. think we're saying it right. I'm going to run with it. 
Ellen, um, how long have you been looking at I've this I've been game? looking. We, this is our take, like 5,000. I've been looking <laughs> at this game for a really long time. I've had my eye on it because it's gorgeous. We went to a con. Lo and behold, there it was. And I will tell you why I love it. When you're saying they're watching people play, it looks like area control, but it's so Euro, and I love Euro. You yeah. can live peaceably with other people if you want. Um, attacking is just Euro so much in that you attack, you, you get a sword, you kill a guy. Yeah, It's it's that basic. And you'll There's draw a bunch of, one, two, or three cards, depending on what their strength is, yeah. you know, and then you can at most lose one guy yourself. Yeah. You know, you can most is you can attack somebody as like two if you have unless you have extra cards, blah blah blah. But then the most you can actually lose is one during that battle. Yes. So it's very much a card driven kind of. And like also, there's a new mechanic with this game that people are calling auction programming, yep. which is so dang cool. This is like the core of the game. It gives you AP, yeah. but in a good way. Oh, Lots so of thinking. Good. It's great. It's the meeples. It's like a one through five. Yeah. And the numbers are dual purpose. So the higher number you have the higher you go up on a track, the more actions you get of whatever that is. So mm-hmm. instead of, say, one movement, you might get four movement if you're highest mm-hmm. on the track. But it's also your initiative. So you need to make sure that you have your initiative in the right order. Like, well, maybe I need to muster first. And then I need to straight. put you know, troops to move troops and then tax different lands. So you have to get all that in together like and still be me. on the same amount of you know, <laughs> actions you need for each level. Really it's good. It's really cool. Really and I love that you can use your coins to bribe um, bribe yes. meeples to kind of change the number on your meeples so that you're it not... It increases your strength, but not your initiative. Right. So you can still yes. get higher up on a track, but still go earlier on in the round. It's so clever. It's so dang clever. There's also a trade track and a warfare track um, that are really... Right, in a, in, a war, in a ruling track, and then there's also the building track. So yes. there's four main tracks. The higher up you go on those, you get more points. It's And everything's kind of based around that area majority because things will become cheaper. Mm-hmm. If you control an area, things will become cheaper. Plus, it's you know you take less damage when you attack people. I like that it's like area that. majority and not like you have to be the only ones. That stresses me out. Yeah. I don't love that. But this You can one, completely coexist. You can. What's the point of that? We almost did, but then I killed him. Well. Then he yeah. killed me back. Oh, so In force. So mad. Fantastic game. Definitely recommend this. The art's this. amazing, too. Art is amazing. It's The cover is fantastic. Yeah. Metal coins, mm. it's probably a must because they're It absolutely they're cool. is. They're this really game nice. calls for it, okay? Yeah. I would definitely recommend so those two. Get the whole thing, dang it. <laughs> so <laughs> Am good. I helping anybody's budgets? <laughs> We're going to get yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We will see you on the next one. Yes, we will. Build up your followers, then win the favor of different factions in the trick tacking game, Claim 2, coming up. Stella, this is Claim 2, a sequel and expansion to Claim. This is a two-player trick-taking game similar to German Wist, where you try to win the favor of more factions than your opponent. The game is played in two halves. The first half, players have 13 cards and the winner of each trick gets to take face-up card from the deck. The loser gets the next face-down card. Then the cards you pick up in the first half becomes your hand for the second half and you're trying to claim more cards in tricks than your opponent in at least three of the five factions to win. Each of the suits has different power that affects how it works. For example, giants can steal gnomes that other players have already in their tricks. And this is great and it adds a great level of strategy to the game without making it too random. Now, I haven't played a lot of trick-taking games much before, so it was a bit tricky for me to work out the strategies when playing the game. I had some tips from my other half parent, though, who has played a lot of these games. Some of the strategies around how to build up your powerful hand or how to count the opponent's cards are better to learn using standard playing cards before adding the game's faction power into the mix. Claim 2 is a sequel to Claim, and you can combine the two games to play different combinations of suits or even with a bigger deck to play a four-player partnership version. The cards have adorable art from the Miko for each of the different factions, with children in the lower number and elders in the higher numbers for each faction. Well, thanks for watching guys. We are on the Dice Tower How to Play Videos and Meeple University on YouTube. See you next time! So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'm reviewing City Skyline, Sarah's Vision, Kung Fu Panda, uh, Papi- uh, Papillon, Mezzo, 
and several other games. Uh, so you're going to see that stuff. But the big news about this week is we're doing our 12 Days of Christmas series. Now, you're going to want to watch that for a couple reasons. One, uh, where we have nine different videos where we give you our thoughts on games that you can buy people for Christmas presents. Some new, some old, but hopefully all games that you can easily find to give to people. And you also want to watch these because we have contests in each of these videos to win $50 gift certificates. So I hope you enjoyed that. Eric and I are going to be uh, posting a video to I mean our, our uh, podcast tomorrow in which we talk about our top 10 favorite games to start with the letter J. Is it possible? Not only is it more than possible, but I think the 10 games I picked are fantastic games. So that was a fun episode to record. We have lots of other podcasts, of course. You might watch this videos um, and maybe listen to Dice Tower Podcast, but there are many other great podcasts to listen to. And I recommend you give them a whirl. You can find that all at DicetowerNetwork.com. So all that stuff is happening this week. Lots of videos. We hope you enjoy it. Let's keep going. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Hi, everyone from the Dice Star. We are the Brothers Murph, yeah. and we found Best in Show. We were very excited about the game. We were like, oh, this seems like a cool game. It's got these cool dog meeples. Yeah. We opened it up, ready to play. Unfortunately, there's no dog meeples in the game. Yeah. So we can't really actively review it. So we decided to upgrade the game. Get some upgraded components like people do on BGG and yeah. places like that. So we decided instead of toy dogs, we'll just get actual dogs. Let's get puppies. And they can, uh, they can, they'll, they'll play the game for they'll us. They'll play the game. And you'll be able to get a they'll sense of what the game is based on how they move around the board yes. and interact. But it basically recreates dog shows. Dog shows. Goes you know? a little something like this. Yeah, we'll show you. So, uh, basically, the dogs are going to be going around and working on agility tests and things like the seesaw here, the okay. A-frame. There's a tire hoop. And they're going to be moving around the board because you've got to collect fat cards and dog biscuits and, uh, you know, work on uh, uh, agility things. And you got to do spinners to do shows. And Mary? as you can see right here, Mary's Mary? really working on the A-frame portion. Oh, She's girl. been focusing really hard good on girl. that. She doesn't know that she needs to go over it. She's mm -hmm. trying to go and eat mm -hmm. under it good. right now. Now, Pippin is a little bit of a wild card. You don't no, know what he's going to go. Don't eat the mic. Like don't eat the mic. Don't eat the microphone. Okay. Right? So let's come over here. We're going to work on some training. Work on some training. Look at me. Yes, that's good. That's real good. Okay, so now Pippin's going to attempt to do the seesaw. Pippin, Pippin, can you try to do the seesaw, buddy? <laughs> Mary's doing the seesaw. She got one foot on the seesaw. That's at least a one biscuit uh, performance. Uh, so basically, it's like Monopoly, okay? You roll a die. You go around. You collect the stuff that it shows you. There's no point. It's stupid. But dogs, look how pretty this one is. I like this one. This is Mary, that's Pippin. And uh, they seem to like it just fine, so that's good enough for me. Don't eat the mic. This is just one of those mass market games where, again, if you like dog shows, if you're, maybe your family shows dogs, it shows prize beagles back in the day or something like that, oh, you might like it. Family. But it's just like, it's one of those games where it's like, if you are not into that, What's in your mouth? What's in your mouth? What's in your, what are you then, you're, then you're probably not going to be that in this game. Not going to be that in this game. This is hard to do both these at the same time. Dogs <laughs> are incredibly disruptive, if anyone didn't know. Oh, you're they so disrupt your life in the best way. They're girl. so precious. Anyway, that's it for us, nope. folks. Uh, check mic. out this game if you want, or just play with dogs instead. Don't, don't eat the mic. Don't eat the mic. Don't eat the mic. Not the mic, you silly dog. Uh, they're super fun, and we play uh, better games than this over on the Brothers Murph at YouTube, so go check that out. <laughs> not my hair. Not my hair. Uh, not don't my eat hair. the hair. But uh, until next time, we'll see you in the thrift store, or what I mean is. Just spending all the time with these dogs so they take up all the time we have. Yes, they do. Hi, I'm May. I'm Jordan. This is Second Chance Kids Shelf, where we take a look back at an older kid's game and see if it deserves a second chance off your shelf. This is Mommy's Treasure. Yep. Uh, currently, it's in print as Tiny Park, but we have the older version, Mummy's Treasure. Let's see how to play. So here's Mummy's Treasure set up for one player. It plays two to four players. Each player gets one of these um, four by five grids, and then all of the tiles are spread out in, in piles across the board. Whoever's turn it is takes these five dice. The symbols on the dice correspond with the symbols on the tiles. You're going to play Yahtzee style. Roll, keep some, roll, keep some, roll, and then you have to make a decision. Whenever you are rolling the dice, you want to set a couple aside that are going to match some of the symbols on here. You're trying to set, um, trying to collect a full set. Here, I already rolled uh, this one right here. Thank you, May. And I would put this on my board like this. Then the dice go to the next player, and they do the same thing. First person to fill their board wins. Well, that's a little bit about Mummy's Treasure. I really like Mummy's Treasure. It feels uh, really similar to some more adult games that have the Tetris pieces in them. Like, um, what's the one that we play? All the time with the bears. Um, Bear Park. Yeah, Baron Park. Um, Spring Meadow. 
uh, Cottage Garden, any any of those kind of Tetris kind of games. This one is kind of a children's version of that. May, what do you like about Lonely Shirt? I like whenever you what you need to get a tile. Yep. Yeah, this one has some randomness because you are rolling the dice, um, but it is really satisfying whenever you get to, whenever you roll what you need, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So what do you think about Mummy's Treasure? Thumbs up? Thumbs up. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Cool. This one's staying in our collection. If you find Mummy's Treasure or Tiny Park by Haba, I would definitely pick it up for the little one in your life. I'm Jordan. I'm May. Happy breakfast. Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. This week we're continuing my Through the Years series where we look at the best game on Board Game Geek by year, starting with 1970. This week, 1984. Taking a look at the top five, we see the number one game from 1984 is the card game Wizards, coming in at 732, slightly better than Eat Poop You Cat. Wizards is a breakthrough in trick-taking games. You have the standard 52-card deck, but you also have four Wizards and four Jesters. Wizards are high, Jesters are low. Genius. Wizards is a variant of Spades, just like I said. Only difference really is Wizards are high, Jesters are low. But that little trick makes it twice as good as Spades. Is this really the best 1984 can do? Come on, 1984, you gotta pick it up. Big Brother is watching. Taking a look at the rankings, we see lots and lots of sevens, mostly eights and sixes left over. Over 7,000 rankings, crazy. For an overall ranking of 6.9. Taking a look at the weight, comes in at a 1.74. She lied, she lied to us. So I went out onto Amazon, and I see that the game Wizards is readily available even has this cool thing that says over 3 million copies sold for only $8.46, at least here in the U.S. And free delivery was Amazon Prime. This game can be yours. Hey, if you're suffering from Top 100 Withdrawal, my Top 100 is going on over on the Family Showdown channel. It's about halfway over, but you can catch up. <laughs> So what's getting added to the library this week? Well, first of all, to our kids' library, we're adding Toy Story, Obstacles and Adventure, Cheeky Butts, Drop It, which we already have in the adult library, but I think is good for everybody to play. All right, then for our adult library, from Hook, we're adding Inhabit the Earth, R&D Games, Richard Brees game, I think it's good. Minecrafter, I'm gonna actually have to get another copy of this because I'm gonna probably stick one in the kids' library too. The Networks, which is a hole that we had in our library. I'm glad we got that one at it. Watergate. The New on the Underground. We also have the final Ticket to Ride maps that I did not have. I have all of them now. Navajo Wars from GMT. Marco Polo 2, of course. And the fantastic It's a Wonderful World. And then finally, the mega, the big, the giant new version of Suburbia going into the library. And that's what we're adding this week. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle from the YouTube channel Board Game Bakes. This week I'm going to focus on Wingspan by Stonemeyer Games, which is a competitive engine building game with a lot of very beautiful bird cards. And there's also a really cool birdhouse that you use to help randomize the resources that are available. So this week we're going to learn how to make the birdhouse out of a pumpkin shortbread cookie. This is how you do it. The first step of making your decorations is to use some brown food gel to dye some white fondant. Um, you want to roll it out. I left it with a slightly marbled consistency so it looked more like wood. I cut out roof tiles using the brown color and a long rectangle strip to go over the tip of the roof. I also had some additional green fondant and I used this to break off little bits and pieces to stick onto the birdhouse to give it a more outside look. Next I use my edible food marker to draw lines on the cookies representing the different wood pieces in the birdhouse. Next I use royal icing to put the roof tiles onto the roof and put the moss pieces onto the house. I then use this fun new edible food paint to add some more moss details and aging to the wood for the birdhouse. 
It's finally time to put our birdhouse together. Line up the inserts inside the birdhouse along the edges, and it should fit perfectly on top of the cookie. When I put it together, I did the base component first, and the birdhouse actual house component second. I made sure that they are both completely dry before trying to assemble the whole thing. I also used a little extra cookie bits as support, just to make sure I didn't have to worry about it falling over. Once the birdhouse was put together, I used a green edible marker to help blend in some of the white oil icing and some of the moss. Thanks for watching this quick overview for how to make your own pumpkin shortbread birdhouse from the Game Wingspan. For the recipe and the complete video, check out Board Game Bakes on YouTube, and of course hit subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye! Happy breakfast everyone! In the past week I've been able to play Pappy Winchester, a new auctioning sort of game from Blue Orange. It's fairly light, and I've played it a few times, so I can't sort of say 100% how good it is, but the theming has really sort of impressed me. Now it's an auctioning game where money keeps going around the table. It makes sense because Pappy Winchester, this person has died, and you're collecting the inheritance. You are bidding on different areas of land, and you've got an objective to try and get certain types, and the money you pay is then split between the other players. So. If I was to bid 6,000 for this plot of land, if there's two other players, they get 3,000 each. So the money keeps going round the table. Now, every now and again, when you've got that odd amount, it goes to a special place, a bit like sort of a monopoly free parking, um, which slightly breaks things, but that's just the way it gets around the odd number and being unable to split. But I really like the way it's sort of, right, we're splitting this up. I want this, so that means that's my value, but I need to give you this money because then it's fair on everyone. Everyone's still got the same amount of inheritance as a such uh, from Pappy. It makes sense in explaining it. It makes the game just make a lot more sense to new players. So the theme really helps the game work. Anyway, that's Pappy Winchester. Hopefully it's still good after a number of plays, and I'm Oliver East signing out. Hey folks, I'm adding a new segment to Board Game Breakfast that Tom reviews other stuff. Uh, I know that this is not about board games, and so I guess you can skip to the next segment if that bugs you. But I thought it'd be fun every once in a while. Maybe I'll review a TV show, a movie, food, whatever it might be. Today I'm going to talk about Santa's Enchanted Forest. Uh, Santa's Enchanted Forest is a two-month-long fair that happens here in Miami, Florida. It is a Christmas theme park. In fact, they advertise themselves as the world's largest holiday-themed park. I don't know that there's a lot of competition for that award, but it is a pretty neat place. And we end up going every year. Now, it is a fair. It has overpriced fair food. Um, it has, you know, rides that you hope don't fall apart. I don't know, I mean, uh, there's nothing there that feels unsafe, but it, it's full of lights. But what makes this park unique is when you first get there, you walk almost half mile probably down this lane that has Christmas displays and millions of Christmas lights. And it's really neat because you don't see a lot of these Christmas light displays in Miami because, well, we don't have snow here. So the Christmas, it feels sometimes like the Christmas spirit is not quite so much here, but it's there. And you walk down there, that's fun. The smell of the carnival food, even though it's expensive, does smell good. Lots of fried corn and turkey legs and all that stuff. So you walk down that end, and then you get to all the rides. And there's plenty of rides. I would say there's a, maybe 100 rides or so and little shows that go on. And it's... It's corny as all get out, but it's something that we enjoy, especially since the cost of a season pass is just, I think it's like 1.3 times the cost of a single ticket. So if you get a season pass, you can go multiple times. And we found that if you go at 5 p.m., when it opens, it's from 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. is when the park's open, which is a pretty you know, long spread of hours there. We go early, we go for a few hours, and we get out, the hordes of people come in, and it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, if you live in the Florida area, I would certainly recommend it if you're ever visiting Miami. It's just an interesting thing to do. It's still a fair at the end of the day, but it's an enjoyable one, and the Christmas theme on top of it adds that little bit of flair that sometimes in Miami we seem to be missing. Hello, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Here I have 
10-4, Good Buddy, published in 1976 by Parker Brothers. This is a two to four player game in which you're a truck driver trying to race around the board first without getting caught speeding. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board will look like set up. Everybody's going to pick a different color truck and it's going to start at the entrance of the matching color. The two police cars and the police helicopter will start over here at police headquarters. On every single turn you will pick the top CB card and read it what it says out loud. It'll give you the information on whether to use the high band spinner or the low band spinner, whether you get any bonuses, and whether you need to move one of the police cars or the helicopter out onto the board. When you're instructed to move the police car or the helicopter, they need to be out of headquarters before you can actually move them on the board. So you'll have to pick a bear trap to move them to, and the helicopter has to go to one of these four areas. Once they are on the board, then they are able to move around the board. When you spin the spinner to move your truck, you have to move that many number of spaces in a clockwise direction around the board. If at any time you stop here on a bear trap and there is a police officer hiding behind a billboard, you have been caught speeding and you have to lose your turn. If at any time a police car comes behind you, on the space that you're on or in front of you, again, you are caught speeding and you will need to miss a turn. The helicopter is patrolling the color area that he is on. So that means if you spin anything higher than an 8, you've been caught speeding and you lose your turn. Anything lower than that, you can go ahead and take your turn as normal. The object of the game is to make one loop around the board and exit where you started. If you can do that first, you have won the game. CB stands for Citizen Band, and this game was made during the height of the CB craze, partly due to the 1973 oil crisis and the nationwide 55 mile per hour speed limit. Now truckers would use the CB to communicate to other truckers where there was gas available and also warn them of speed traps. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet them to me at Retro Board Gamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. My name is Jonathan. I'm Steve. I'm Amy. I'm Mark. And this is our speed quiz where contestants are attempting to guess as many games as they can in a particular category. And this week's category is miniature games. So this is any game from the top 500 actually on Board Game Geek. Uh, that has miniatures in some kind of prominent way. It's not just a random first player token, but there are miniatures that you are playing with as you go through the game. And there are 42 possibilities that they can get, and we're going to start with Steve. Off uh, you go. War of the Ring. Yes. Rising Sun. Yes. X-Wing. Uh, yes. Scythe. Uh, no. Ooh. Imperial Assault. Not enough miniatures, I guess. Uh, that's Star Wars Imperial Assault, isn't yes. it? Yes. Star Wars Armada. Yes. Max vs. Minions. Uh, yes. Massive Darkness. Uh, no. Blood Rage. Yes. Mage Knight. Uh, no. Again, I think not enough miniatures. Dark Souls board game. No. Battle or Second Edition. Oh yes. Uh, Arcadia Quest. Yes. Um, stuffed Fables. Mm, no. Zombie Side. Uh, Black Plague yes yeah, so you'll get that one the original zombie side is not in there uh, Arcadia Quest Inferno are there any other? no there's only one Arcadia Quest Green Wars Ooh. no don't think it's high enough uh, Green Horde for zombie side Three seconds trust. left no Star Wars Armada we've had that right. uh, open it to the floor last few seconds uh, uh, Memoir for. Memoir Second 44, edition. yes, and Descent, yes, and we'll play with time. Can we second <laughs> count up the scores and we'll see how they did. All right, the scores are in and we have a different winner this week. <laughs> so we've got Amy with two, Steve with four, and Mark wins with six. Well yeah. done, Mark. Uh, other games you could have had were Claustrophobia, Conan, Cyclades, uh, Gears of War, Hero Escape, Kingdom Death Monster, mm -hmm. Nemesis, Spectre Ops, Spartacus, the Battle of Five Armies. So lots and lots that they could have had there. Um, thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. So this is an interesting thing that I thought about the other day and that some people were talking to me about, about winning awards. And there are lots of board game awards out there. 
there's the Dice Tower Awards. There's Board Game Geek has their own awards. We got big awards to Spiel des Jahres. But there are so many little awards out there. And companies put these awards on their boxes. Why wouldn't you? I've often, you know, said that, you know, even if I won, if I was a board game publisher and I won some small award and some guy was like, this is the official blah, 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 blah award and I'm the one guy giving it out. I'd be like, great, put it on the box. And you say, well, why? It's not that big of a deal. Well, it is a big deal because people, when they're looking at games, will see a game with awards and think invariably that's probably better than the games that haven't won awards. Now, you might be watching and saying, I'm a savvy person and that doesn't affect me. Fine. But it definitely does affect people. Now, there's very few awards that affect sales tremendously. Uh, the only one I can think of off the top of my head that really affects sales is the Spiel des Jahres, maybe the Mensa Awards, but, you know, Dice Tower Awards. Our fans might get those games, but I'm not kidding myself to pretend that our awards are going to push thousands of more sales like the Spiel des Jahres can push in the tens of thousands of more sales. But there was a secondary effect of awards that I found out recently that had never even occurred to me, and that's to the designer. Now, as a designer, to win an award is a great thing. Of course I want to win awards. It just feels good. But it's easier for a designer to go to a publisher with a game if that game has won an award, whether that award is, you know, the best game at the protospiel convention or what have you, or if their previous games have had awards, like, hey, my name is so-and-so, I designed this game, which won this award. A publisher is going to take note of that a little bit and go, oh, well, somebody somewhere thought that this designer was a pretty good person a pretty good game designer and I'm going to take a look at their game now because that first game got an award and that's an interesting thing that I hadn't thought about that you can use awards to springboard yourself farther as you design and go forth and that's pretty neat right you know and that's a, a, a cool thing it definitely is uh, as someone who you know we give seals of excellence and seals of approval here in the dice tower and we don't give those out willy-nilly, especially the seals of excellence. And it always is gratifying to us when we see a company get, or a designer get really excited about getting one. And I get that. You're glad when someone likes your game. I didn't realize, though, that you could then you know, use that and kind of manipulate that to help you go farther in the industry. And that's, so that's a cool thing. So I'll admit, I'll look at some games that have six awards on I've never heard of, and I roll my eyes a bit and say, whatever. But that's helpful. It's helpful to everybody. It's helpful because you're saying, some people really liked my game. And that will cause people, whether consciously or subconsciously, sometimes to give that a chance that they wouldn't have otherwise. And how is that a bad thing for the hobby? Hi, I'm Doug Jr. And you are watching A Fellowship of Meeples. So I've come here to my favorite friendly local game store, the Game Masters Guild here in Crestview, Florida, and I'm going to pick out a game to purchase to add to our gaming group, but I'm going to need your help. There are several really hot games that I still haven't bought and haven't even played yet. Uh, first of all, here's one you might be surprised that I haven't played yet, Wingspan. Yeah, that's right. This is uh, put out by Stonemeyer Games. Got a lot of hype, a lot of buzz. Uh, it's been a while that it's been out, but people are still talking about it. I've never had a chance to play this, so this is one possibility here, Wingspan. So here's another game that has gotten a lot of buzz, and that is Everdale. Everdale is a charming game with little wooden animal meeples. It's got a really unique uh, board that's set up. Uh, it's put out by Starling Games, and it plays uh, one to four, and I've heard some good things about this, but I've never had the opportunity to play it. So this is also a possibility, and that's Everdale. All right, well, here's another option, and that is Star Wars Outer Rim. Heard a lot of good things about this, but again, I haven't had a chance to play this. Now, of course, this is put out by Fantasy Flight Games, and it appears that this plays one to four as well. We have Wingspan, which is number one. We have Star Wars Outer Rim, the number two choice. And then the number three choice is Everdale. Go to the comments down below and tell me which game you would buy if you were here. These are all pretty close to the same price, within a $10 or so. So just tell me which one you would buy and why you made that choice, why you think it would be a good addition to our gaming group. 
might be easier just to roll a die. But I think I'd rather know what you have to say. So let us know which one of these would you buy. Hey everyone, I'm Matthew from Dead Last and This Game Is Broken and uh, hello, welcome, I hope you're having a wonderful breakfast. This week I'm going to talk to you briefly, oh so briefly, there's something that's been stopping me from playing games recently and that is the fact that sometimes I'm a little bit intimidated by games. There's always games that I really would love to play that I really think, I think I'd really enjoy that. Maybe the theme has taken me and I think, oh, I'd love to play that. Or maybe it's a solo something that I can just go, I could sit down and I could play that and I'm being smart and using my brain. And I don't do it because I'm a bit intimidated by the complexity of the game. But then you see so many other people playing those games. You go online and you look on some kind of war game. And for me, it's war games. And you see someone play this chits and hex game and you think, well, they're playing it. They're not magical. They're just a normal person. Yes, they have an expertise in something else that I don't, but surely I can get in. And it's nerve-wracking. And you just, it stopped me from doing things. And there are lots of games that sometimes I think, that one I won't bother playing because it's a bit too complex. And But then you hear so many other people say, once you know how to do it, it's not that bad. And that's the same with everything. Like driving a car is a bit too complex for most people until you learn how to drive a car. So are there any games out there that you have never tried because you've always thought they're just too complex perhaps for you to bother learning? For me it's war games and I really really want to start playing some because there's so many nice war games about feudal Japan. I think I'd really enjoy Okay, so that is it for another Board Game Breakfast, folks. Thanks so much. Thank you to all my fantastic contributors who do a great job each week. Um, just, it's so, it's, so, it's so exciting. A week from now, we have our 24-hour marathon. But we still got stuff that's going on this week. Live breakfast coming on Thursday. So we hope you join us. We hope you have a good time and watch our videos and enjoy the 12 Games of Christmas series. I will say this. If you can't always watch our videos but you want to listen to them, then you can go to DiceTowerVideo.com. That's a podcast where we take the audio off of many of these videos and you can just listen to it as a podcast form. It's not, not all the reviews, but definitely top 10 lists and things like that. So, yeah, you know, if you're driving in a car and want to listen to us, that's a way to do so. Alrighty. Well, thanks to everybody. We're in the holiday season now or pretty soon. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast, or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.